Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca, Rebecca Fielding. And uh, for most of my career, I've worked recruiting and training graduates. And during that time, I've noticed something. I've noticed that there's a gap in the expectations between what graduates expect and hope to be doing when they graduate and what they actually do after they graduate. And I really want to close that gap, not because I'm here to crush anyone's dreams, <laughs> given how inspirational the rest of today has been. Uh, the, the team brainstormed on that. They came up with Dream Smasher rather than Dream Crusher, but I wasn't a fan. Um, so I'm actually here because I think by closing the expectation gap, and giving you a more realistic expectation of what will be happening after you graduate will not only allow you to uh, be more successful, but absolutely more happy. So, I want to start by just outlining what I think the gap is. And I've got four statements up there that are going to form really the four different things that I'm going to talk to you about. Um, now, not for everybody will those four things apply, but for the vast majority of students, graduates, and indeed their parents, at least one or two of these statements will apply. So when I talk to people about what they expect to be doing when they leave university, these are the kind of things that they say. So I, I, they will hope and expect to get a job on a graduate scheme. Perfectly reasonable. They hope to be using those all-important leadership skills that you've all been told to work on and develop and hone since you were at secondary school. I'll be earning about £27,000. That's the national average. That's what we see in the papers. And um, uh, I'll be working for somebody, hopefully, this is a little tongue-in-cheek, like Google or the BBC, the UN, perhaps. And that is a little tongue-in-cheek, the last statement. But without exception, when I ask people who they hope and expect to be working for, there's usually at least a couple of names that are household names and everybody's heard of. Now, most of you might look at that and think, well, yeah, that looks perfectly reasonable, at least one or two of them and they are very much aligned to my own expectations or hopes. But from my experience, not only are most of those statements wildly inaccurate, they're also unhelpful. So what I want to do is to reframe those expectations into a new context and help you to really reach for the stars from where you are right now and realistically, what will be happening after university. So we're going to start by closing some of these expectation gaps. Let's start with the first one, working on a graduate scheme. So many graduates that I talk to, when I ask them about what they would like to do, talk about starting a career on a graduate scheme. Um, Unfortunately, when you look at the statistics and the numbers on both sides of the fence from the graduates being produced by universities and the employment statistics, whilst there's no direct correlation, it would actually bear out that the most graduates will work on a graduate scheme. In fact, by my estimations, looking at HESA stats and, and uh, also employment stats, from the 2014 graduate class in the UK, between somewhere between six and 11% of graduates will get a job on a graduate scheme. So this is the first important thing that I'd like you to hear. Not getting a job on a graduate scheme is not a failure. And so many people feel that it is. And that's such a shame. Actually, it's the exception to the rule to get a job on a graduate scheme. It's not the norm. But it's more than this. Actually, I think we need to really get away from the expectation and the mindset that getting a job on a graduate scheme is the equivalent, in job search terms, of getting a first in your degree. Yes, graduate schemes often come with a great deal more prestige and more starting salary. But that doesn't necessarily mean 
but it's the best place for you to start your career or the best role for you to start your career. And in terms of the experience I've had, it's certainly not an influencer in terms of where you start in an organization as to how far you can get in terms of your long-term career and success. On top of that, I think one of the other things that I would really like to encourage you to think about is whether or not a graduate scheme is the right thing for you. Actually, if you're a highly autonomous, highly ambitious, uh, highly creative individual who really likes to make an impact, you might really struggle on a corporate graduate scheme. I know lots of graduates who get one of these highly coveted jobs and then leave within a short period of time. They don't feel that they can make a difference. They're a small cog in a big machine. They can't, make, uh, can't get any accountability or responsibility as they move around from department to department to department, doing the same training as everybody else, on the same salary as everybody else, with dozens of people recruited at the same time, a faceless sheep in the flock. But there are lots of graduates who do thrive on graduate schemes and for whom it's a great start to their career. I simply want to offer it to you as an idea that it's not for everyone. And I'd really like you to encourage and encourage you to think about what's the right thing for you and what you're looking for at the start of your career. So that's the, the great graduate scheme expectation. Let's move on then to the second expectation, using those all important leadership skills. This particular area I think is fascinating. If you Google graduate leadership skills, you'll get just over 16 million hits. Comparatively, if you Google graduate work ready skills, you'll get just over 5 million. And for me, that level of disparity and the gap between the two areas is fairly representative in the difference between what graduates expect and hope to be doing with those all important leadership skills and what they will be doing with those leadership skills. But I can't blame you for having that expectation. Since secondary school, you've been encouraged to do the Duke of Edinburgh Award, to go and do the Graduate Leadership Award, to be the prefect, to be course captain, to demonstrate those leadership skills. And employers seem to be obsessed with asking you about your leadership qualities and leadership responsibilities. Everyone, it seems, wants to be a leader, and you should too. But the reality, weirdly, having been encouraged to develop these leadership skills for so many years, is that most employers are unlikely to give you a position of leadership responsibility for quite some years to come. Now, there are some uh, exceptions to that. Retail, hospitality, tourism, those types of industries where people leadership is an integral part of, of a graduate scheme role right from the beginning. But for the majority of sectors, it might be many years before you're given people and leadership responsibility. And when you reflect on it, that makes sense. Why would an organization bring a brand new graduate into the organization and give them leadership responsibility, managing people who've potentially got many more years experience, knowledge, and skills in a particular area? And this expectation gap can cause real disillusionment and frustration with graduates. I've seen it many, many times. People expect and hope they've been told throughout their education and career to develop it and refine and hone those leadership skills. And then they're put into roles and responsibilities that appear to have a complete lack of leadership responsibility. And that can be hugely frustrating. So, this is the second important thing that I need you to hear. You probably won't be a leader from day one. But that doesn't mean that you're not going to be using your leadership skills. And actually, what most employers mean 
when they ask you about your leadership skills is they're looking at your long-term leadership potential. So long-term, have you got the potential, the emotional intelligence, the mindset to be able to lead projects and people in the organization? But in the short term, they're really interested in your self-leadership skills, the skills that allow you to be highly effective in the work that you're doing, working with other people, prioritizing your time, managing resources, making connections, getting things done, stuff that many graduates are truly brilliant at, but they simply weren't prepared for. They thought that they needed to work on and prepare for being a leader. But it's not the thing often that you're going to be making the most of in terms of your skills when you get into that first role. So, I offer you this as an idea. When you get into that first role, or even before, rather than being frustrated and disillusioned at the fact that the organization isn't making the most of those leadership skills, reflect instead on the leadership skills that you are using and you can make the most of. Develop them. Prepare for them if you can before you enter the world of work. Because if you can develop and refine those self-leadership skills, not only will you be more effective in those first roles, you're probably going to steal a march on your competition too. Because you will be more ready to make a difference and to get noticed. Which leads us nicely onto point number three. Getting noticed and the rewards and benefits of that. So, I'm going to be earning about 27,000 pounds a year. Okay, so this is the 27,000 pounds a year is the figure that most of us see in the media. Um, and simultaneously, this particular expectation is both really easy and yet very difficult to change. It's really easy because it's absolutely not true. And the information is widely and freely available to members of the public and to students and to anybody who wants to look. For example, we're here at Aston University today. So I went and had a look on Unistats. Last year, if you graduated with uh, BA in French, then your average salary was 20,000 here at Aston University. Management and accounting, 23,000. You can find this information. It's specific to your course and graduates. It's highly recent. And these salaries are exceptionally good salaries. Aston University graduates are sought after, highly talented graduates who get good jobs. And yet the figures I've just quoted to you are massively different to 27,000 pounds a year. And many graduates who get salary offers at this level feel that they're a failure. That's just wrong. This is the third thing that I need you to hear. A salary after graduating of 18 to 20,000 pounds a year is a fantastic success. You should be really proud of starting your career at that level. It's a recognition of your skills, of your knowledge, of your hard work and your potential for the future. You should not feel like it is a failure because the national average is apparently 27,000 pounds a year. So where does this 27,000 pounds a year come from? Well, it comes from um, the media. Specifically, uh, the media are provided with two um, pieces of research every year from the Association of Graduate Recruiters and the Times Top 100, both of which are exceptionally good, well-respected organizations that produce very good research from a wide membership base of employers. But those employers, I know because I was one, provide specifically often the information about their corporate graduate schemes. So, for example, when I worked at the Cooperative Group, we provided the average salary for the Corporate Leadership Graduate Scheme, 
we didn't provide the average salary for the many thousands of other graduates that we recruited that year who weren't on the graduate scheme because we simply didn't capture that information. And so the £27,000 a year is reflective of those corporate graduate schemes that I talked about in point one, the 6 to 11% of people. So it's simply not an accurate reflection of what most people will be earning. So what I really want to do is to change what people are expecting to earn because parents, peers, friends and you are continually bombarded by this unrealistic expectation and it's making people feel like a failure when you're not. If you want to know whether or not you're a success at the beginning of your career post-graduation, there are much better expectations to look at and benchmarks to use. Look at the average for your course. Look at the average for your region, for the sector, for the types of jobs that you're interested in going into. Those are the things that you should benchmark yourself against, not this figure. That leads me on to the fourth one, which is about who you're going to work for. I'm going to work for Google, the BBC, UN, Apple, somebody like that. It sounds ludicrous and it is an extension really. I wouldn't expect AB to give me that particular list. Um, but as I say, we very often hear a lot of household names. And what's really important to say is that a big and recognizable name isn't necessarily a good thing for you or the right thing for you. Of course, we all want to go home and tell our parents and our friends and our peers that we're working for an organization like this. Somebody that everybody recognizes, that's got a great reputation and people have heard of. But actually, this is the fourth thing that I really want you to hear and I want to tell you about these expectations. Small and unknown employers can be much better for you than the big ones. They might not be, but they can be. Small organizations can be incredibly agile, fun, creative environments where you can make a difference, get involved, have an impact, and the chief exec will certainly know your name, how much you're costing, and the difference that you're making. You can get rapid progression. You get recognized quickly, and you can make a difference. Big organizations that perhaps you haven't heard of, they can offer you just as much stability, just as much training, investment, and structure at the early stages of your career. But in both cases, the competition for the same jobs is much less, simply because it's a name you've never heard of before. So I'd like to encourage you to look at organizations that you're interested in with people and a culture and a value system that interests you. Look beyond a name. In fact, forget the names altogether. Go and seek out the products, the people, and the organizations that interest you for what they do and who they are. So to conclude, I really want to change this statement of expectations. I want to change it from this to this. I want people to look for the right entry point into the right organization for them. That doesn't need to be a graduate scheme. I didn't start on a graduate scheme, and three years later, I was managing the people who were on that graduate scheme, earning considerably more than the people who started at the same time. And as you go on in your career, it's how you perform and what you do and how talented you are that makes the difference, not how you started or where you started. I want you to make the most of your self-leadership skills because those are the things that are really going to help you not only come into an organization, be effective and be successful, but ultimately be more happy in the work that you're doing. I want people to be realistic about what success looks like in terms of salaries. I want so many fewer people to be upset and to feel a failure when they get an amazing starting salary. 
And I'd really, really love people to look for organizations that are as unique as you are. Because you are not a failure. And you are not normal. You're unique. And your career will be as unique as you are. Where you start on that process is actually irrelevant to where you'll end up. But if you can be more realistic about where you might start and how you might start on that journey, then you are much more likely to be prepared, to be successful, and critically for all of you, I hope, be happy working in an organization and a role that you enjoy. And that is what I wish for every one of you. Thank you.